the goat segments and uh, a new um, little thing we do called goat nuggets, which are just short um, informational pieces that may help you with your investing. Uh, if you're new to creative finance or if you're just checking it out, you're not sure if it's something that might be for you and you don't want to spend a ton of money on courses or uh, mentorships or any of that stuff. You just want to check it out. You can try our low cost uh, coaching, $7 coaching. It's only $7 a month. Uh, I'll answer your questions for you every week. And we have a lot of other investors there who are doing deals and can be very helpful. So check that out. You go to $7coaching.com. If you are already in creative finance and really want to get into it heavily, you can check out our premium coaching group, Sub2 Max. In fact, uh, we're coming to you from Apollo Beach, Florida right now. We're down here in Florida uh, getting ready for our next live three-day mastermind that we do with our Sub2 Max students. So if something like that appeals to you, check us out at Sub2 Max. I'd also like to ask you to uh, invite another investor. Share this. Uh, on your wall, take screenshot, share it, and uh, invite anyone over that'd like to watch or that could benefit from it. If we have a few people that'll share today, um, we'll give away a nice freebie. So if you share, let me know in the comments. Uh, hey, I shared it on my wall. If we get a few people to do that, then we've got uh, a nice little guide that we'll give you today uh, on handling seller objections. How many people have a problem with that? You don't know what to say. The seller's on the phone or when you talk to them and we put together a guide that will address most of those in, uh, investor questions uh, that you may get that uh, throw you just a little bit. So if you're on here, say good morning. Let us know who you are, where you are uh, and what you do. Hey, Matt, good to see you. Allie, Allie's one of our Mac students, also one of our teachers in Sub2 Mac. She is a VA hiring training expert. And she teaches our students in there how to do that. Andrew, good to see you. Uh, let's see, how are you using an HSA, if at all? Okay, we'll get to those questions here in just a minute. Uh, Kevin, good to see you this morning. Charles Blair, man, the mad scientist is in the house. We got to have you on again, Charles. Good to see you on here. Hope you're doing well. So uh, Jody may pop in here for a few minutes. We've got a company that, that's coming soon and she's going to go pick them up. So she may join us here for a few minutes. We've got Dora here. Good to see you. Okay, guys, so let's get started. If you've got questions, uh, just throw those in the comments. Uh, we would love to answer them for you. Hey, Randy, good to see you. Brad, good to see you this morning. Uh, so uh, we're going to get to these questions. Hey, Adam, uh, Randy and Adam got all kind of Mac students in here this morning. It's great to see y'all here. Uh, so let's see, let's, let's get going here. I sent out a, uh, a questionnaire, uh, really it was basically just one question and said, Hey guys, what is keeping you from doing a deal? What is keeping you from buying your first property subject to, or with seller financing or something other than just going to the bank and getting a loan? And a lot of the, the, the answers were surprising. I guess they shouldn't be, but you expect most of the answers to be technical uh, things. I, I found that probably half of those questions were all about mindset and it was really about a lack of confidence um, just in your ability to be able to do things. And also, in my opinion, a lack of um, feeling like you're worthy to have more and do more. And actually, we're going to start bringing on more people that address things like mindset and changing your way of thinking and feeling like you deserve more and that you're worthy of doing better. And, you know, a lot of people are born into situations or something happens to them in their life and they uh, they feel like they're in this rut or they're in this place that they're never going to climb out of or that they don't deserve to get out of that, that somehow they're a bad person and they want to do better, but they just don't feel like karma is going to bring that to them. And that's just not true. Anyone can do better. And, and like I said, that's not what our topic is this morning, but we're going to start bringing on some people that talk about how we feel about money and mindset and that sort of thing. So I hope, uh, hope that will be helpful to some of you guys. But getting to the questions specifically and the answers, um, this first one was really 
let's just get this out there. If the question is why, what is keeping you from doing a deal? And the answer is I don't have a contract. Okay. I've run into this a ton in my experience, and that is especially new people involved in this uh, business think that a, a contract where you're taking over payments is some type of magical, uh, highly unusual, very different sort of, of contract. And it's just not. Any contract that you use for any real estate purchase can be used for subject to. Now, the recommendation, there's a couple of things that you add to it. You want to address the fact that you're purchasing the property subject to. And in fact, if you're one of our uh, sub two forum or $7 coaching members, we've got that right there in the group. It's just an addendum that you can attach to any contract, but I'll just tell you basically what's in it. And you can add that as an addendum. You can write it in the special stipulations. You can do that any way you want to. And it's just that, you know, this property is being purchased subject to the existing loan with Bank of America loan number XYZ in the amount of, you know, $97,362 uh, payments to start being made on a certain date. And you just want to be very specific on those things. Make sure that's in your contract. That really, simple as it is, magically turns that contract into a sub two contract. So there you got that taken care of. If you don't have a contract, it's no big deal, is it? Uh, let's see. Matt has a question. I've been coaching with Pat Precord on mindset and his content's really helped. Great, Matt. Good to hear that. I'm glad he helps. We're uh, like I said, we're going to bring on a couple of people. I actually did a podcast with a lady a few days ago that focuses on that sort of thing. She was great. So I think we're going to have her on. So anyway, but glad Pat's able to help you. Again, if you guys have questions, let us have those. I'd love to answer those while we're here. Now I can go through my list here if you like. Uh, another question, I've been taking action uh, since last year, sending direct mail to probate leads. I've also called them. I've gotten very little response from about a hundred leads with at least three letters sent monthly to each. Uh, my advice would be you're going to want a much broader audience than a hundred leads. If you take a hundred leads and you just hammer those things constantly, uh, what are your chances of getting a response? I would rather go very broad uh, and, and target a whole bunch more people. Uh, I'm not a probate expert. Probate has never been a target audience of mine just because I don't like the association with that. I just don't like the way that makes me feel. Now, I know a lot of people are that way about maybe foreclosures or divorces, but I'm that way about probate. So uh, every time I have a probate guest on, I think we had Sharon Bornholt on and she talked about probate. I always get really, you know, I really need to do that. That sounds really exciting, but then I always want I'm not doing it. So, uh, but my advice would be to you, it's not the probate leads specifically. It's the fact that you're, you're fishing in a very small pond. So you want to uh, get into a bigger pond, uh, get out into, you know, a lake, an ocean, whatever. Uh, a lot more targets would be my advice to you. And I think you'll get some results. Hey, Cindy, good to see you. Cindy down there in Mississippi. Hope you're having a great day. Uh, there, let's see. Um, got a question. Uh, Khalil, hope I'm saying that right. How do I buy property subject to that's on Zillow exactly? Well, a property that's on Zillow that's for sale by owner. Uh, I've bought properties for years and years, just picking up the phone and calling them, having a conversation with them, and finding out if me taking over payments is something that might work. Now, these days, that's tough. You're going to call a lot of people. Uh, the market's crazy. Sellers have this overinflated sense of what their property is worth in a lot of cases. And, uh, and that may be a little bit difficult, but it's still done the same way. You're going to buy that property subject to the same way you would any other seller, whether they're in foreclosure or anything else. Uh, have a conversation with them. Find out if you making the payments until you can get a buyer will work. And then if they're local to you, you'll go out and meet with them and, and fill out some paperwork. And if they're remote from you, you'll send that through DocuSign or hire a mobile notary 
to go out there and get those things done. And the process is just the same. Uh, if you'll go to sub2deals.com, uh, if you're talking about remote stuff, I've got an article over there, how to buy real estate remotely. And uh, if my producer jumps on this morning, she might be able to find that and put a link in here. But if not, all you have to do is a search over there. And that'll take you step by step through, um, through remote. I've completely lost my train of thought. My, my producer's here talking to me. So, hey, Phil, good to see you. Hope that helps uh, on how to do those on Zillow. It's really just, it all starts with a conversation. It doesn't matter the seller. So, uh, good to see you. Joaquin, good to see you here. Uh, hey, let's see. We've got Mark on here. Good morning. Have to listen to the replay. Yep, just pick up the phone and call. I mean, it really is that simple, isn't it, Mark? a conversation, you know, one of my coaches in, in something that a lady that coaches me is a completely different topic, but something she says is so true in business in general. She says the fastest cat uh, path to cash is a conversation. And that certainly applies here as well. Let's see, Matt, what's your advice on getting our first sub two deal and wrapping it? How quickly do you think we can do it? And how would you do it? Well, first of all, Matt, I would not use a wrap. And I know in some states, if you're going to do business, that's the preferred method. And they have a lot of legislation that makes it uh, painful to not do it that way. So if you're in Texas, uh, that could be a problem for you. Uh, we sell on contract for deed. If you're talking about buying subject to and selling with seller financing in general, uh, in this market, you you can sell a house very quickly. You know, 60 plus percent of people that approach a mortgage broker about getting a loan can't qualify. And I think Andrew's in here today. He can probably verify that number. Uh, that means these people are actively looking for houses. Everybody wants to buy a house today. Getting a seller to give you the authority to take over the payments and, and then walking away, it still happens on a regular basis. There are people who get a divorce every day and can't afford uh, to pay with one income. There are people that have to get job transfers that don't have a ton of equity. Every market isn't screaming, okay? So you get that thing under contract, you start marketing it immediately. Our goal is always to have it sold before we buy it. And, and typically if they're not in distress, if our sellers aren't in distress, you can allow yourself 30, 45 days to close and you can get your buyer installed in that period of time. So go out there, get a house under contract, Matt. If it's a nice house, if it's a good house, someone wants to live in, you'll find a buyer for it. I'm telling you, it, finding a buyer is definitely the easiest part today. And I think you can certainly do it within 30 days. Okay, so I've got, I think my producer's on today. Hey, you made it. Hello. Hey. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Great. So, I'm, on, Jody, I'm on as a guest, so I can't see questions now or anything, just so you know. Okay. All right. So, so she's going to be on as a guest, not a producer. <laughs> so that's I can't okay. see any. I can't that's see okay. any we're glad controls. That's, we're, we're glad to have you. So if you have questions for Jody, she'll answer your questions too. Uh, hey, Kristen, good morning. Tracy's here. Good to see you. Steve Riley in Arkansas. Good to see you, Mark. Uh, Mark adds to his earlier comments, follow up, follow up and build a relationship. That's right. And, you know, a CRM is super important. I'm not going to try to sell you guys a particular one today. I'll tell you that we use REI Blackbook. Um, and some of the questions that we've got here, we'll get into a little bit later when you're talking about follow up and things like sending out offers, you know, a good CRM is very important for that. The best thing about it, and I've been using one for years and years and years, but the best thing about a CRM is if you have a conversation and they say not today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, you don't have to remember to call them back. Plug them into a workflow and, and just let the follow-up take care of it. Send them an occasional text, a uh, ringless voicemail, an email. And it's, it's really funny. I get answers all the time from sellers who are like, hey, thanks for checking in. Uh, we're still not ready. Just keep in touch. They think we're sending this stuff out to them personally all the time. And, you know, one day when they're ready, hey, you know, they'll give us a call. So 
uh, it just works out really well. Uh, I would like to know how to buy houses subject to that are on market. Okay, so this is a follow up to the Zillow. Uh, I'm not sure if you're talking about technically or if there's some difference uh, with houses that are on market. If you're talking about they're listed with a realtor, that's going to be a little bit different. Uh, if the house is listed with a realtor, first of all, you're going to have to get that realtor to present your offer. And that's a challenge in itself. Uh, realtors and, and Jody, you can speak to this. You've been a broker. So realtors are bound by their ethics and, and the, the rules to present any offer made. Am I right? Yeah. Unless yep. the, and the thing a lot of realtors will fall back on is, why well, I have to present that offer. The seller told me not to present blah, blah, blah. Listen, I'm telling you, you know, 99.99999% of sellers wouldn't know to say exclude sub two offers. They just wouldn't know. Um, so that's not the case. Getting uh, the typical realtor to, realtor to uh, present your offer is going to be a challenge. My advice to you would be um, something's going on with the sound. I'm not sure what it is. It's popping a little bit. I'm not sure either. I'm, I hear it too. I don't know if it's my phone yeah. or not. Right. Uh, but find a realtor that understands investors that would be okay with presenting those offers and uh, get them to present them for you. That's what I would do. If you're looking for houses that are on market listed in the MLS. Now, as far as just on market, FISBOs, people that are listing on Zillow, things like that, just initiate a conversation with them. Uh, find out their situation and, you know, ask them, uh, depending on their situation. If the house is free and clear, they let you know they're only interested in cash. Uh, that's probably not going to work. So get a little bit more specific with me and I'll see if I can help you. That's really annoying. That's, that's it is. Sad. If I, it is. If I leave, tell me, I mean, I'm going to see if it gets better. Okay. All right. Uh, Kristen, how do you do sub two and seller financing hybrid deal? I have a seller who still has a little bit uh, in mortgage and would like to possibly do sub two and seller financing. Well, that really depends. It depends on what the seller needs. We've bought houses from people before that insisted on uh, they had equity. They had 10 or 20,000 or whatever in equity. Uh, and I don't hear anything right now because okay. you're not in here. I don't know. Okay. About okay. <laughs> All right. So, and we would just write it up. It depends on their motivation level. It depends on what they need. Uh, for example, we would take over the payments on the existing financing and they wouldn't get anything until our buyer refinanced. Okay. So that's a possibility. If you have room as far as cash flow, you can arrange with them to pay them interest only payments and you pay those alongside the mortgage payment. So you make their mortgage payment every month. And let's say they have 20 or 30,000 in equity. You pay them 2% or 3% interest only payments every month until your buyer refinances. If there's enough cash flow to allow for it, you can get them to amortize their equity over a certain period of time and you can make amortized payments to them. So you can structure it a lot of different ways. It just really depends on how much room you have to do that, how flexible the seller is, um, but you can do it a ton of different ways. So uh, not very specific, but the point is there are a ton of different ways that you can do that. It's really going to depend on your seller, what they need and their flexibility. So Kristen says, trying to figure out how to do the paperwork, uh, how to do the paperwork on that. When we typically buy subject to, regardless of the structure, we give the seller a note. That's the first thing that we try to do. We try not to record anything to encumber that property uh, at the courthouse. Now, some really savvy investors, uh, excuse me, uh, sellers will insist on a note or mortgage recorded at the courthouse. And that's fine. We can do that. But we try to just give them a note for their payments. Okay. Um, that's what we prefer. Anyway, hope that helps. Uh, hey, Tammy, good to see you on here. 
you're having a good day. Uh, Matt, how do you ask the seller are you going to buy subject to without confusing them? Okay, Matt, well, have this, think about this conversation for a second. If you've got a house listed on Zillow and I call you up and I'm talking, I say, hey, Matt, you know, I see your house on Zillow. Tell me about it. I already see a little bit, but I'm just really trying to engage them in conversation. And the, so they start talking and they tell me all about their house. And then I'm going to try at various points in there to ask questions that find out about their situation. Now, let's say, Matt, that you uh, are in the military. You just bought your house last year. You didn't put anything down. You're the, the seller of the house at the time paid a lot of the closing costs. The house is worth 200000 You got a lot of feedback there. My guest is really messing things up here this morning. She's lucky she's so good looking. Uh, but anyway, so you bought the house for 200, you financed 210. Okay. And now you're getting a transfer. You're getting transferred across the country to another base. You owe 205. The house is worth 210. You got zero equity. You can't afford to pay a realtor. You've got to get this thing sold. You got to be across the country in 30 days. And let's say where you are, the market's not super hot right now. You you, you, you put a FISBO sign out in the yard a month ago when you first got your orders and you haven't had any bites and you're getting desperate because you can't afford to pay for housing where you're going to be. And then on this house too, what do you do? Well, that's probably going to come out in the conversation or I've got prop stream up. I know what you owe. I know when you bought the house. Uh, I know the situation. I'm going to pitch this to you and I'm going to say, Hey Matt, you know, you owe too much on the house for me to make you a cash offer. That would have to be somewhere in the 130, 140 range. And I know you can't take that. But if I have a way where I can pay full price for your house, I can pay what you owe. You can get down the road. Would you like to hear about that? What are you going to say? Well, yeah, I need to sell my house. And I say, what if I could make the payments for you until I can get a buyer in that can get new financing? Do you think that might be something that would work for you? And you might say, no, it won't. Uh, I don't want to rent my house. And then I have to explain, no, we're not going to rent it. We're actually going to buy it, but we're just going to continue to make payments on your loan. That's already in place. We can buy it very quickly. Uh, there won't be any cost involved. Normally a seller pays some closing costs and some other stuff. But if we do it this way, you won't have to pay anything. And we're just going to make those payments until our buyer can get new financing. Is that something that might interest you? Well, maybe. Okay. So you continue the conversation. That's how we introduce subject to, to 99% of the sellers. The only time we'll ever really talk about the technique might be if we're talking to a, another investor who understands that stuff, but that's pretty rare. So I hope that makes sense. That's how we introduce it. And we just keep it very simple. So anyway, if you have any other questions on that, let me know. Uh, Joaquin, if a seller wants to do the owner financing deal, do I fill out the sta standard purchase agreement? Absolutely. Joaquin, every real estate purchase starts with a purchase agreement. You absolutely need that each and every time. The, only, the purchase agreement just spells out the, the, the person that's buying, the person that's selling, the terms of the arrangement where it'll close, the closing date. It just nails down all the details, but you definitely want to start with that standard purchase agreement for sure. And our purchase agreements have it built in because remember, anytime something's built into a contract, it's more uh, normal, okay, than if you have to write it in. So make sure your contract has a provision in there for seller financing where you can just fill in the blanks, okay? So even if it's a seller finance deal, if it's a uh, subject to if it's a cash deal, whatever, they all start with a purchase and sale agreement. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, what you got? Can you hear all this background noise, or is it too is it too noisy? No, that's fine. Okay. okay. Sorry, I know doesn't I'm bother, a lot of trouble. Doesn't bother me. Oh, and you're worth it. You're so worth it, though. Corey, I have a question on selling a note. If you happen to have any insight, does it affect the note value selling on a contract for deed? Yes, it does. Uh, I've had this conversation with uh, Chris 70. We're going to have him back on here talking about 
actually were talking about. I was on his podcast a few days ago, and we were talking about having him back on to talk about how to create uh, the most valuable note. And if you are selling on a contract for deed, it does devalue as opposed to a regular note and mortgage. It does. How much depends on some other stuff. And uh, there are a lot of variables there. It depends on what the note buyer is looking for and some other stuff, the seasoning of the contract for deed, the length of the term and, and all the standard stuff that would apply to other financing, but it does devalue it. So, but I'm not looking to sell any, so it doesn't bother me. I'm still confused on the documents process on acquisitions and dispo side. Matt, I'm telling you, you're, you know, you're on here all the time. You're, you follow us. It's great. We'll help you any way we can. I'm telling you, I, and I don't know, you may have someone that's teaching you. You may ha have bought a bunch of courses and not had it explained to you thoroughly before, but there's a specific process involved in that. We've got, I actually think we've got, a YouTube video that has the process and the paperwork and list those out. I think we have that on YouTube, but a really good course that will lay it out for you step by step and give you the documents and tell you how to use them. That's important or some, some real coaching on that or a mentor that can step you through the process. And it's hard to put all those pieces together from YouTube and all the, all right. these little odds and ends. It's hard to piece them together. It is. We, we try to teach as much as we can on YouTube. I actually heard a, uh, a teacher in the space say the other day that YouTube's only for entertainment. We try to teach as much as we can on there, but there's a limit without the back and forth. Uh, but I'll tell you this, and if we got some people on here that'll, that'll jump in and maybe confirm this. I know we've got a bunch of people here that have it. We have laid out step-by-step step in the sub two guidebook, <clears throat> what forms you need and the order and the process that things get done. Uh, and uh, if you want to take a look at that, you know, if that's something that interests you, I guarantee you that course lays it out for you. I, know one, 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 I did. I bought it long before I knew you, not long before, a little before right. I knew you. Right. But um, one of our other students, what did she call it? A, a uh, the sub two Bible or something like that. She she said her husband called it her purse because she carried it with her everywhere. She oh yeah, went. she put like she attached like straps to it or something. That <laughs> Pretty was much. Jessica. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was Jessica, I don't know. She I don't think she's on here today, but uh, Jessica said yeah, she said that. And listen, uh, I mean, you know. It's it's easy to follow. It's easy to understand. I actually wrote it. A ghostwriter didn't write it. So you you you've talked to me a bunch, Matt. You know I, I keep things pretty simple because I'm not real. Well, and if you're in the group at all, you see you see how he writes. It's very plain and clear and well explained. So I'm not trying to. I'm not here to sell you on that course this morning. I'm just telling you. If you're confused about the process, you need something that's going to. But it's that. good. It's just good. So and it it will. Okay. Uh, okay, sounds great. All right, then. If we got any other questions, you guys just let us have those in here. We're going to work down our list of some of the questions that we got uh, this past Elsewhere. week. Elsewhere. Elsewhere. Okay. Uh, again, following up with the questions about what's keeping you from doing a deal, uh, this response was time. I don't have the time to even look at the software I've purchased for finding deals. Time is not on my side. I work a W-2 job and real estate investing hasn't been working well together with my job. I don't know. This responder didn't say how many hours a week they work. I will tell you this. When I got started, I was a director of operations for the entire state of Georgia for a fast food restaurant chain. I covered the entire state of Georgia and I worked 60, 70 hours each and every week. I drove hundreds of miles every week and then worked in, in the units there. Uh, I did stuff when I could. I made phone calls from my car. I, at the time, we didn't have things like Facebook and PropStream and, uh, and, and REI Black, but we didn't have all of these tools that you guys have. I would drive for dollars when I was out. If I was going a certain way to go to the grocery store or do whatever, I would take down addresses. Once a week, I would go to the tax office 
and look up because that's the only way you could do it. They weren't online. Uh, you would have to look up the owners and their new addresses and then send out postcards or, or make phone calls. Uh, I still got things done. I'll tell you, if you want to be an investor, you can do it in a few hours a week. Uh, there are so many tools available to you to learn. And not only that, you talk about subscriptions to things and I, and, and I sent out an email about this a few months ago, the most expensive subscription that any of you have is Netflix. Okay. And you know, the response to that's always, well, gosh, that's only nine bucks a month. That's cheap. That's not expensive. It's expensive to you and lost opportunities because when you decide, I got home from work. I'm tired. I want to sit in front of the TV for four hours tonight and binge watch some, the latest number one, Netflix will even tell you, right? This is number one in the country this week. Watch this program. When you spend those four hours doing that, instead of learning something about your market, pulling up a list of leads, <clears throat> get facing those so you can send out cards or make phone calls or get on the phone and talk to a seller, that's costing you money. Okay. Well, our VA this morning just talked about how he, his, what he does in his spare time is he watches tutorial videos. He doesn't watch TV or movies. He watches tutorial videos so he can right. learn his skills better. And that was bad English, but you know what I mean? <laughs> that's right. I mean, so, you know, it, this guy, I mean, he's young well, and he's a little older than we thought. I think he's in his late twenties. He's in Nigeria, super ambitious, has a job, wants to work himself out of his job. He put a gig up on Fiverr. We hired him. He's done fantastic. He's got another client now. He said, when I'm working 60 hours a week, I'm quitting my job. 60 hours a week, this guy wants to work. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to sacrifice to have a better life? And you know, I, I'm telling you for years, I didn't watch television. Okay. At all. I was too uh, into learning the things that I had to do. Most of you guys know my story. Uh, I worked that kind of job. I bought a Carl and Sheets course and 12 months later, I quit my job. Okay. That was, that'll be 23 years ago this August. I've been buying houses for 23 years. You know, that's not 50 years like some people have been doing, but it's not two or three either like some people out there have done. They bought houses for a few years and now they're the expert on everything. I'm telling you, um, it's worth, you know, if you will live for just a little while like others won't, you can live for the rest of your life like others can't. That's just a fact. That Netflix subscription that you've got is costing you a lot of money and a lot of opportunities. So... Don't give me the I don't have time excuse. I, I'm not buying it. I, I had no time when I got started. No time at all. Cindy said, we bought a house sub two, financed it to a homeowner on a contract for deed. We sold several notes and our buyers weren't interested in the contract for deed. To be fair, we didn't market the contract for deed separately. We got our attorney to negotiate a discount on the underlying mortgage and we are paying it off and then moving the buyer into a note and deed of trust that we will sell. Okay. So, you know, Cindy, just confirming contract for deeds have less value. Uh, Chris 70, if you guys have listened to my podcast, well, you haven't listened to my podcast with him on our show, but we just put out on his show, good deeds, noting that investing, go check that out. If you're going to sell or finance, it was funny. He and I talked about this the other day. I said, I didn't realize for years, I'm really in the note business. That's what I do. I buy houses. I sell them with seller financing. I'm a note guy. Okay. I didn't even realize it until just the last few years. That's what we do. So anyway, contract for these, yes, they're worth less, but I still like them. And if your intent is to keep them, um, it's not a problem for me. So I like it. Okay, Matt, I never thought about how much TV takes up time. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not saying give up family time. We're talking about mindless, thoughtless things that we do that we could easily give up. Sitting in front of the TV is the biggest time waster ever, isn't it, Jody? Yeah. <laughs> Jody likes her Netflix from time. I like a little. A little I'm bit. not crazy. That's right. I know. Uh, William, what is your preferred strategy for newbies starting in a state like Texas for marketing and contract to 
tool. Uh, marketing, that's the same. I, and if you go to um, Facebook, is it StreamYard.com slash Facebook, I think. Then we'll know who you are. We can call you by name. So anybody on here that hasn't done that, make sure you do. Uh, marketing, marketing is all the same. And for the content, uh, my recommendation to you, have your own contract that you can use. And if you run into any issues with that, then just use the regular Board of Realtors contract. If you can use that, I think a lot of, of students say they use, I think it's a track contract is what they call it. Uh, just a standard board of realtors. Now, some states have a problem with that. They don't want you using their contract, and that's okay. Uh, but have your own. If it's a problem, use the local whatever everybody's used to seeing and they're okay with. Uh, it really doesn't matter your contract. As far as marketing, marketing's the same pretty much everywhere. You know, you've got some people that bash on old school marketing. I love it. That's what we do. Uh, we put out bandit signs in Apollo Beach the other day. Okay. Uh, that's just what we do. We like direct mail. We like uh, bandit signs. We like posting in groups, uh, wholesalers. They're an excellent source of leads. Uh, you know, mortgage brokers, real estate agents, network with everyone. Let everyone know what you do, no matter where you are, and you will generate leads. You just, you just will. It's just a, it's just a mathematical certainty. Uh, let's see, Cindy, our intent was not to keep the deal. We wanted to sell it. We didn't want to hurt our seller. I got gotcha. you. All right. Let's see what else. Uh, when you think you don't watch TV, you still put three hours in easily watching the news and a program here or there. Yeah. And I'll tell you, watching the news, you know, I used to watch the news all the time. I watch the news. I listen to talk radio. I was trying to keep up with all of that stuff. And I stopped doing it about three years ago. I said, you know what? I have to spend a certain amount of time on Facebook every day with students and other things. And if anything really big happens, that's going to impact me. Somebody's going to mention it on Facebook and I'll know about it. And I'm a much happier person not spending all that time in the news and everything else because uh, I don't know. Hey, Ashley, good to see you. Uh, Ashley Jackson. She's a, a hella investor out in Houston, Texas. <laughs> investor, rehabber. And uh, it's good to see you. Okay, hope you're doing well. Uh, Carlos, it never fails. I was early for Goat Talk, had no signal where I was earlier. Hey, we record this stuff and we don't delete it. So you can watch it later. It's good to see you on here. Carlos is one of our Sub 2 Max students. Uh, let's see. Yes, you will see it somewhere. Not sure what that is, but... Uh, Appreciate the comment, the news that is. That's true, because everybody's going to be talking about it. I mean, you know, one actor can slap another one at the Oscars or whatever. I, I don't watch those programs, but and that's all I saw for two weeks. So you'll definitely, definitely hear about it. Uh, Ashley, you and Jody are my faves. Hey, I appreciate that. I appreciate the heck out of that. So you're our fave too, man. Part of the family, part of the investor family. Glad to see you on here today. Uh, Cindy, thank you all for taking the time to answer our questions. Well, you know, we're just as happy as we can be to do it. And uh, if you guys have any more, throw them in here. We're working our way down some of these. Man, I, I tell you, I, I'm prepared. I'm, you guys think I, I get these things all day, every day. People send me questions. And that's why we started doing the Ask the Goat. Uh, there's that way a lot of other people can benefit from some of this stuff, too. So. Uh, glad to help you guys. Uh, you didn't miss any of the Oscars drama. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I, you know, there's enough drama out there. You don't need any more of that stuff. Let's see. What's our next one? Uh, I'm overwhelmed with where to start. Okay. That's common with new, new investors, overwhelmed with where to start. Listen, find yourself a community. It doesn't matter if it's paid or not. There are a million Facebook groups. OK, some are better than others. It shouldn't take you long. Go in, uh, read a bunch of posts. Uh, if you have any discernment at all, you'll figure it out pretty quick. Uh, but go in, watch some YouTube videos, find something that appeals to you. When I got started, I looked at everything. I didn't know what any of these terms were. I'm telling you, you talk about a newbie. I was. You know, the only thing I knew about real estate at the time, I think I had bought three homes 
uh, personal residences. And all I knew was that qualifying for a loan was a, a miserable process. And I showed up at an attorney's office at the end of it all. I wrote a check and I signed a stack of paper this thick that I couldn't read anything. He just said, sign here, sign here, sign here. And I just suspected that if I said, hey, I want to read this stuff, I would have gotten some disapproving looks. So I signed all the paperwork and I had a house and that's how it worked. So I knew absolutely nothing about how financing worked, especially creative finance. Um, but I just, uh, you know, I, I, I took that course and I got started. And I'll tell you my advice to you today, learn a little bit about everything. Learn what, what's wholesaling? How does that work? Learn, you're going to learn that wholesaling is transactional. You get a payday and then you got to be working on the next one. OK, but I knew I wanted to replace my job. I wanted cash flow, but I didn't want to be a landlord. I didn't want people calling me day and night. If, if something went wrong, the air conditioner broke, something like that. So what can I do? So I quickly settled on that I wanted to do something like owner financing, where you know you just create the paper, you get the down payments, you get the cash flow, and, and that's what we settled on. To start with, learn what you think it is you want to do, and then just start having conversations with sellers. Just get on the phone with them, talk to them about their house, go look at some houses. You know, it's you'll feel like later maybe it was a waste of time, but it's really not when you're getting started. Get a feel for the area that you're going to be working in. No values. Meet some people. Go to an investor club. You don't have to shoot out of the gate and buy a house. Learn, get the lay of the land. See what's going on. Meet some people. Talk to a bunch of people. And then get a focus on what it is that you might want to do. Invest in a real estate course. I would recommend for anybody to do that. It doesn't have to be mine. There's a million of them. Ashley Jackson's in here somewhere. She just released one on subject two. Check her out. She might be more to your personality style than I am. Okay. And that's, that's all right. Learn from somebody that does the business and then have those conversations with sellers. And I'm telling you, when I first learned about sub two, I'll tell you how it went. When I first learned about it, I thought, I'm going to really try this. And so I got a call off a bandit sign, a guy, he said the magic words. I just want to get rid of it. I turned around. I, I took the next exit and got back on the interstate and drove straight to his house. And here's a tip for you. Have a buyer's briefcase. Because when somebody calls you, you don't have to go get any paperwork or do anything. I had a buyer's briefcase. I had, uh, at the time I was carrying... Uh, promissory notes, uh, contracts to buy, uh, uh, contracts to buy with lease option, uh, rental applications, uh, you just a whole bunch of different things. Anything you might need. If, if somebody approached me, if I was at a house we had bought and they said, man, I really want to buy this house. You know what? I can go out to the truck, pull out a, uh, a sales agreement for, for this pro seller because they're different. Pro seller contracts, pro buyer contracts have all of that stuff with you all the time. I drove out to his house, got it. You know, he, he man, I'm getting a divorce. I can't make the payments on the house. They're current now, but I can't keep making them. We, we wrote up a contract right then, bought his house, made $28,000 off the first of two and didn't do it a hundred percent right. Messed up the deed, did a bunch of stuff wrong. Uh, but anyway, it all worked out in the end. So if you're confused about where to start, just start on YouTube, start in Facebook groups, start talking to sellers. When you see what you're really interested in, invest in some education and take action every day. Do something to get further along. Stop watching Netflix so much. So I hope that helps. I don't know. That's just, th th these are, you know, this, this show, um, I'm just giving you my opinion. Everybody's got a different one. Okay. Uh, let's see. Can't find that lead that's ready to walk with little cash and relief. That's what's keeping these people from buying their first house. My producer's leaving. Yeah. Okay. Be careful. Okay. So uh, it's a process right now, guys, finding those leads that are willing to walk away. You have, you're going to have to sift through a lot more leads right now. Are they still out there? Absolutely, they are. We've got uh, students in Max right now. We've got one guy, Phil. I don't know if he's on here today. I'm going to message him today and ask him how his first sub two is going. 
Uh, he's getting handed a house with substantial equity. He's got a lot of options and these people just wanted to get rid of this house. So, uh, but you're going to have to filter through a lot more people. Okay. That's just a fact. Uh, when the market switches again, and it will, and it always does, it'll be easier. But right now, just be prepared to talk to a lot more people and put a lot more lead generation mechanisms out there. That's absolutely what you're going to have to do. Uh, let's see. Facebook user, imperfect action beats perfect act, inaction. That's absolutely right. Do something every single day to improve your business. Talk to someone, put out a bandit sign. I'm telling you, we got our bandit signs and we put a bunch of them together and they're in the back of the car. And then anytime we go out, we see an opportunity, jump out, put a couple out. It's just that simple. You don't have to do a bandit sign run and put out 10,000 signs at one time. You don't have to do things that way. So uh, if you guys have questions, let me know. I'm just going to run through more of these. Um, what do you do if you can't dispo the deal and you let the seller down? You know, this piggybacks off of Matt's question for earlier. Uh, this is what I advise my students to do. If I get a call today from a seller and they have a house to sell and they want X amount for it and I get their story and they're open to sub two, I'm going to head out and talk to them immediately. If they're local, if they're remote, I'm going to send a contract to them right away. I don't have to put them on hold and verify uh, loan balances, value of property, all of those things before I get this house under contract. I just don't have to do it. And what's more, if I wait around to do that stuff and a real investor comes along, he's just going to get it under contract. We get houses under contract based on what the seller tells us all the time. And our contract also says, you know, this is all subject to verification of loan balances, arrear amounts, uh, and, and property value. So, and we give ourselves enough time in most cases, that's usually seven to 14 days to verify the title, loan balance, value, and everything else. Get that house under contract and then sort it out. One of the things that we also put in our contract is that we can start marketing the house immediately upon getting it under contract. And that's one of the reasons we also get a limited power of attorney from our seller at the initial paperwork. When we get the contract authorization to release, we get a uh, seller's disclosure and a limited and specific power of attorney. We can list that house. We can put it on Zillow. We can list it with a real estate agent. We can put signs in the yard. We can put directionals all through the neighborhood. We can put it anywhere, Facebook marketplace, whatever, and gauge interest in the house at the terms that we're looking to sell it for. So we know all of this during the due diligence process. I can just about guarantee you, unless it's a really horrible house in a really bad neighborhood, that you're going to have a buyer. Okay, probably within those 14 days that will give you a substantial earnest money deposit on that house. It's only going to be if you made a mistake, if the, the house is overpriced, if you're trying to sell it for too much, if it's not in a good neighborhood, the schools are horrible. There's some things that you need to verify. Okay. And you should know if you're working in specific areas, you should have a good idea about those things, especially if you're working local. Uh, but if you can't, if you don't feel confident during your due diligence process that you're going to be able to close on this thing, then you've got a couple options at that point. You can reach out to other investors to evaluate the deal. Maybe they'll take it off your hands and work with the seller and do something, or it can just not pass the due diligence process. Contracts fall through all the time. There's no shame in going back to the seller during that period and say, Mr. Seller, you told me you only owed 150, you owe 200,000. This just isn't going to work for us. You know, we wrote this up based on what you told us. Uh, there's no problem with that. And that's the way that you should do it. Uh, we write up houses all the time and occasionally we'll have a situation where it doesn't just doesn't work out. If the seller misled you, the comps didn't support the price that you agreed to pay, uh, then that's what you need to do to, uh, to get out of the contract. It's not a weasel clause. It's just a fact of life and it happens from time to time. So I hope that uh, answers that question. You guys, we've got a few more minutes left and uh, we're going to get out of here. Let's see. 
when taking over someone's monthly mortgage, uh, the mortgage still stays in the seller's name and you just pay the monthly payment for them. Correct. Is that correct? Well, it depends. You know, we had an example earlier today that was a hybrid deal and that's where uh, perhaps the seller still owed a hundred thousand, the house worth 200 and they want 200. Can you do that? Sure. You can, you can take over the hundred subject to, you can write the seller a note for their hundred thousand in equity and either make amortized payments or no payments or uh, interest only payments to them for that portion. Uh, our favorite of course, is to, take over payments when we don't have to give the seller any equity. We just take over the existing mortgage. So that varies and uh, it may work a couple of different ways. Uh, sometimes there's not even a payment involved. We'll just agree to pay the seller their equity when our buyer refinances. Um, let's see. We got any of you guys got any questions? Let's have those. I want to mention a couple of things uh, here. There've been, there's talking about the Oscars and drama and things like that. There's been a lot of talk lately and, and I've made a post or two about this. You guys have heard me talk about this and we're going to have a couple of guests on in the next two or three weeks uh, about how to form your own LLC without having to use an expensive service to do that. Forming an LLC is a pretty expensive process. We're not going to give you legal advice on this show that we're going to do about LLCs. We're going to bring Bill Walston back on and he's going to talk about forming an LLC in the best way that's going to also give you asset protection. But in addition to that, will save you the most in taxes, how to use it uh, and what the costs are state to state. They vary a, a whole lot. So, we're going to have that soon. And then also there's been a lot of talk lately about setting up uh, your business to get a business line of credit and how to do that. And there's not an overnight solution for that. If you don't have decent credit now, you're probably not going to be able to pull something like that off within the next 90 days or so. But there are some things that you can do. Um, that can help you and assist you in getting business credit. One thing you can do, I, I'll tell you right now, we're going to bring someone on to talk about how to do that too, without paying an expensive service, but uh, set up your business properly. Okay. Whether that's an LLC filing uh, a DBA uh, and getting a DUNS number. DUNS, uh, a DUNS number is free to get. It's like a social security number for your business. You can go to probably dunnandbradstreet.com online or just do a search for them and, and start that process, get that stuff started. But we're going to talk about a whole list of things. We're actually putting together a guide for that as well that we're going to provide for you guys on step-by-step -step what to do to go out and set up business credit. So we'll have that stuff coming here uh, in the next few weeks. Do we have to have a land trust or can we set that up later? You know, the funny thing, uh, one of the funny things about a trust is most of a trust is private. So your deed will need to reference the trust. Uh, in my opinion, it should anyway. Uh, it should reference the trust. You can take title in your LLC subject to from your seller or you personally and then deed it to the trust later, but you lose that anonymity that is so important. Subject to and land trust are a perfect combination for total anonymity because let's say Matt, that you go out and you buy a house with bank financing um, and you buy it in your own name. Okay. Um, okay. So if anyone does a search for you, there you are, you bought the house, the mortgage is in your name. It's filed at the courthouse as well. So you're on a deed, you're on a mortgage. Well, if you buy a house subject to, um, your name is never found anywhere. The mortgage is in your seller's name. The deed goes from the seller to the land trust. That's nowhere to be found. Even if you took that house you bought at the bank and deeded it from yourself to a trust, there would still be the, the mortgage filed. Okay. That would still be out there. And that's just not the case when you use a trust. Okay. So no, you don't have to use a trust. You can set it up later. Ideally it'll be set up at the time you purchase. Guys, we have uh, about three or four minutes left and uh, haven't seen anybody say that they shared this. 
if you guys will share it. Now, remember, I've got that, uh, that guide I'm going to give you later today. Send dollar notes. When taking over someone's payment, they're in bankruptcy. How would selling the property affect the seller? Well, first know that if they're in bankruptcy, you can't take over the payments unless that asset has been released. Now, there is a process for that. And most of the time, if the house doesn't have much equity, the seller, there wouldn't be any uh, funds to make uh, debtors, uh, excuse me, the, the lien holders or the, the people that the, the, the seller owes whole, then the trustee will release that asset. You can petition them to do that. It's a simple process. A lot of times it just starts with a letter. Will you let this, you know, release this from the bankruptcy? Then the seller can sell it to you. Uh, so it's really not going to affect the seller at all in a bankruptcy because it can't be included in that process. Uh, Matt, is the operating agreement the main part of the LLC? The operating agreement is a significant part of the LLC that a lot of investors overlook, don't do. Uh, and I'm not, I, I hate to talk about, I talk about Jody, why she's not here to defend herself, but you know, that was, she set up her LLC and a lot of people do this. And when she flipped her first sub two, uh, the title company asked for the operating agreement and she had to get that together to get her check. So, uh, yeah, it is an important part and it is a part that's overlooked a lot. Uh, great info. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Sand dollar notes. Uh, appreciate having you on here today too. So anyway, we're going to bring some people on. We're going to bring Bill on to talk about how to set up an LLC properly, the steps involved in that and uh, the best way to do it. And then we're going to bring an expert and I've, I've actually talked to two or three, not sure if we're going to have a panel here or how we're going to do that, but uh, we're going to bring someone to talk to you guys about how to get started setting up your business properly and applying for lines of credit and how to get that done. So anyway, we're going to show you how to do some of that stuff uh, where you can save a substantial amount of money doing it. And you need to be doing this stuff anyway. You need to, to set, uh, set up your business properly. Uh, so that it's totally legit and, uh, and you can do some of these things. So listen, appreciate all of you guys that showed up today, brought your questions. We're always glad to help you with that. Again, if you haven't, uh, Subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and we'll deliver more content to you guys. If you're interested in some very affordable coaching, man, that is the, the most affordable coaching on the planet. Uh, you'll be in a group. We have a lot of forms available in there, some videos. We do uh, a live each and every week and answer questions uh, just like this. So we'll do that for you too. So guys, join us in there. Take a look, see what you think. And uh, always um, share our live stream with another investor and uh, maybe somebody else can benefit from this too. I didn't see anybody say that they shared today. Maybe somebody did here at the end. I'm not sure, but, uh, but you know, we're going to give you something today anyway. Uh, I think we've got something here on seller objections. So we're going to give you this. It's our handling seller objections guide. And you can go to sub2deals.com slash seller objections uh, and pick that up. So I uh, hope you guys have a fantastic week. We'll see you next week. We're going to have Bill Walston on here talking about LLCs. Uh, get out there and uh, talk to some sellers, buy some houses. We'll see you next Thursday.